sensible way to move forward that industry in the end accepted, uh, given the total totality of the package that was received. Harvest strategies, I'll mention those. And basically, we, the other issue we had was we were part way through implementing ITQs and it had come to a bit of a standstill. We're now completing that process and we'll have ITQs in all our major fisheries by the end of 2010. And, and criticised by some, I know, uh, but we're also including in that package at the moment the, the northern prawn fishery. So we're going to may well have the first ITQ prawn fishery in the world, I think. Okay. There's some of the broader environmental issues that we had to deal with. Deal with discarding. We now account for discarding in our TAC setting process. We don't do some of the other things that I know are done in North America, like I think uh, compelling fishermen to bring it all back to shore. We don't do that yet. It's, it hasn't got on our agenda, but we do account for it through our observer program. We get estimates of discards and those are included. Um, broader environmental uh, impacts of fishing. I'll come back to that because it's a, a more detailed issue. And monitoring fishing activity. Now we have now uh, compulsory vessel monitoring systems on our entire fleet. And also that's enabled us to work very closely with the Environment Agency in terms of managing their MPAs because they now contract us to put geofences around the MPAs so they know when any fishing vessels are near those or inside them and they can track them and, and we can tell from the VMS whether they're fishing or not. We moved it away or moving away, are moving away from CPUE based uh, data series as the basis of our assessments for, for target species. Uh, we know that in many cases they're unreliable and the, the move is towards independent surveys which basically means a change in costing um, and a change in the way we do a lot of those, th that work. It's about a five year program to go through the transition. It doesn't happen quickly because you need a baseline of data to work with. But our major fisheries are, are all heading in that direction and some of them are already there. And strength and advice to the board, which is now the commission. This issue was important because the commission was, was basically very much biologically oriented and, and uh, had a lot of industry background there too. Not a lot of economics was going on and even less social science. And so a combination of a set of new commissioners with AFMA now employing two economists has, has turned that around and we've changed the structure of the advice we give the commission. So harvest strategy policy was, was probably the big uh, statement that came out of the direction. And as I said, what it does is it, it, it really states the acceptable level of risk that the, the government is willing to take with its fish stocks by setting limit and target reference points. And it does that comprehensively. So if you don't have them, it sets defaults. And well, you can't calculate things like uh, biomass or fishing mortality, which we can't for a large number of our fisheries. Other tools are employed to do this, essentially do the same thing. Like we have very large uh, closed areas in our fisheries, often exceeding 40 or 50 per cent of some of our smaller fisheries, just because we don't know. Some people have described it as an insurance policy, others as uh, you know, a way of securing the future for the industry itself, because we know we're going to get a lot of what we do wrong. And what we need to do is make sure that we've set aside a sufficient amount of our fisheries areas so that if we do get it wrong, they can recover and we've got a means of actually improving the way we manage. The other thing the policy does is it's absolutely transparent. It's black and white, signed off by ministers. Everyone knows what it means. There's a set of guidelines that go with it so that there's an interpretation of the policy to avoid any confusion on that front. And, and that it's worked very well. We've now employed this for the past, I think, three years, and um, it's been very effective. Again, we, we had the advantage of T Tony and, and others who worked in the southeast fishery of really trialling this process prior to that, which gave us some good guidance as to how to formulate the policy for, for general application in our fisheries. Now, this is one of the... Um, the maps, it's not a particularly good one because I stuck this in rather late. But on there you can see there's some sort of bluish, purpley areas and the other bits I think look a bit brown. Um, those bluish purple areas are the uh, MPAs that are in place in the southeast region. And these, these, this, this arrangement of having MPAs in the Australian fishing zone is being rolled out across the country at the moment and, we're, and the industry is heavily involved in that as are we. 
Uh, the Environment Agency has done a terrific job. We, we had a few stumbling blocks for this first one, but it proved to be a useful learning experience for us to improve the process of consultation and collaboration for the rest of the country. We've now gone through that, and these are being rolled out and will be completed by the end of 2010. So those purple bits that are down in that southeast area will inevitably arise all the way around the country um, as, we, as the MPAs are rolled out by the Environment Department. The brown sort of tawny looking stuff is a fisheries closure for the trawl fishery. So we take this stuff pretty seriously. We basically shut down the entire trawl grounds below 700 metres for two reasons. One was we had an issue with orange ruffy in our fishing zone, which meant that it was considered uh, below B limb, so below the limit reference point. And the Environment Department made it clear that if we didn't do something, they would. So we did. And the industry has accepted that as an outcome. A uh, lot of debate, of course, but it's accepted it as an outcome. So we're protecting those deep water fish stocks like Orange Ruffy and Oreo Dory on the one hand. The other more fundamental reason is that we are a cost recovered agency, half by the industry and half by government. And the issue was that we had, we had, industry has a habit of exploring new areas in a fairly ad hoc manner and actually causing costs to arise in terms of assessment and management that were becoming unsustainable for both the broader industry and us. And what we, what we decided to do with the industry support was, was close areas of, of the AFZ to fishing until such time industry and and AFMA could sit down and work out, OK, if you want to open an area up, let's do it with the planning in front rather than behind and work out what the costs and benefits are, get some economics in this, and then figure out how we do it. So that's another reason we've applied it in the southeast, but also in other parts of Australia as well. Let's uh, just give you an idea of what we've been up to. Now, the adjustment funds, the, the bit industry loved and hated at the same time they got a $220 million package as part of this deal to get things like TACs down, MPAs rolled out and a whole lot of other things. This, so industry pretty much got what they asked for from the government. The government, was, I think, was exceptionally generous in, in doing this. The, the process was administered by the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. So, so, forestry, so AFMA, as, a, as the management agency, had no role in, in this. We, we stepped back and said, no, we, we do the day-to-day -day management. This is, a, this is essentially a government-sponsored adjustment program dealing with a lot of social and economic issues and that it's right that government should take the lead and so they did. So $149 million was spent on buying back fishing concessions in some of our key fisheries. There was $50 million for onshore businesses and regional adjustment. $15 million went to AFMA to offset levies and that was because over the past three years our costs went up because we had to do a whole lot of work on harvest strategies and those sort of things for our fisheries to get us to where we should be. And, it, and the government regarded it as unfair that industry should cop the entirety of that bill. So it chucked in a whole lot of money to make sure that there was fair sharing of, of, the, of the cost in that regard. And another six million was put in for science compliance and data work. Things like getting our whole fleet onto VMS, um, doing some of the policy work that sits behind this and, and, and having the strategies in place for things like harvest strategies, spatial management, how we deal with byproduct and bycatch, those sort of issues. So they were picked up out of there. So I, I always regard EBFM as a bit of a jigsaw and We've been through a process which I'll briefly describe here. Tony talked about the level, the, the ERA process and the different levels of assessment. So we went from a qualitative assessment process, this is dealing with the target, bycatch and byproduct species, those 2,000 or so. Now, what came out of that process, which is what I want to talk about. So as part of the EBFM uh, big picture, we'd gone through this ERA process after those three levels, we actually only had about 45 species that were, were regarded as high risk, and most of those were elasmobranchs. So this has been very successful from everybody's point of view. It's been a great way of dealing with uh, a whole raft of species that we, we just couldn't have dealt with in the traditional way. 
It's focused management's attention on about 45 species rather than four or 500. And it's meant that we've been able to fairly quickly get on with dealing with those. We now have a, a, an elasma bank strategy that we, we're just rolling out at the moment to deal with the, the, uh, the issues around sharks, skates and rays. Uh, that followed a major workshop in Australia of all the scientists, and, and both internationally and nationally, uh, who gave us advice on, on how we should handle some of those issues. And that's been put, now put into a policy context. I would say that this whole process has taken uh, some time for some people to accept. We had a lot of good industry leadership in this. We had a lot of people who were, um, how much time have we got? Okay. And so that was really useful. But there's still a lot of uh, laggards out there. And they're not just an industry. They're also in, in the environment portfolio. They're also in my own agency. But people struggle with change. And this has been a major change for us. And you've got to manage it well. OK, I won't, I won't talk about the EPBC Act more too much. One of the other links in this process has been to Marine Stewardship Council accreditation. Our industry uh, peak body is now taken an initiative to get pre-certification on all our key fisheries, which will use a lot of this risk-based information that we've got uh, in doing so. And the la one thing I'd like to talk about is assessing AFMA's performance. We get assessed every year by an independent group within the government who look at our performance. And they, they produce this fishery status report. And this status report is, is currently traditional. It's a, it's a, a key commercial species focus. The one that will come out this year will have both biology and economics in it. And we're hoping that the one that comes out in future will, will be a more sort of ecology, economics, and social perspective of our fisheries. So we're making progress in terms of how we're assessed as well. OK, there's some bits missing. I'll go through these quickly. We're still working on benthos and community issues with the ERA. Uh, we've, we're just getting to the point where we've got policies in place for byproduct, bycatch, and spatial management. Uh, where does EBFM leave industry? Definitely a smaller eco footprint from our point of view. Uh, a more consolidated industry. We've seen a lot of uh, accumulation of, of uh, quota into fewer hands in Australia over many years. Uh, focused on fishing grounds that like, are yield to, like, likely to yield profits. Most of the profits and the, the, the catch comes out of a very small proportion of our fishing zone. And the industry at last is recognising that, that that's their business. That's where they want to focus their attention. They don't have to worry about some of these other areas that are never going to yield them much. And co-management. We're now at a point where we're actively working with industry to move from a a collaborative approach with them to where we give them some delegated decision making is a real possibility. Future challenges, my last slide. Um, the risk-based approach is, is a beautiful tool for us. The cost of it to do in a bit of time, but it's got a, it's got a lasting benefit to us in terms of, particularly with governments and the budget position they're in now, it gives you quick solutions, a quicker way of doing business and a more cost effective way of doing business. <coughs> We've got some way to go to full implement implementation of ecological risk management. Those benthic and community issues are still under development. Minimising interactions with protected species, that's where I think industry has to take some leadership and bear some of the risk of what they're doing on the water. And, uh, and some of them are, are, do do that. I think the herd of McDonald Island fishery is a good example of where that is happening and others aren't. We have the issues of management in Australia with consistency between the states inside the three mile line and our international fisheries, always a problem. Reducing the, uh, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Bill burden on fish, act on fisheries, where we have some duplication which we do need to sort out. So there's some things government still has to do to make things run better than they are at the moment and we're I'm part of that. Defining the essential information needs, what do we really need to know as opposed to what we'd like to know? And meeting changing community and industry expectations. Marrying up communities on the one hand need to be comfortable with dealing with things like the way industry deals with things like bycatch and benthic damage. And on the other hand, industries need to, to be more masters of their own destiny. And how do we actually marry those two things together well? I think that's it. Thank you. Time for a question or two, but I'd like to ask the panel, the rest of the panel, to come up and take their seats. So I'll, I'll take questions.
Do you we just go straight to panel and we can do it that way? Yeah, yeah sure. Maybe. Uh, Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was specifically curious about your comment at the beginning, uh, talking about redistributing risk to the fishing uh, yeah, communities. And I mean, it became a little more obvious, as you said. It sounds like the constituency is almost entirely the commercial fishing industry. Is. Um, so where do I'm not sure in Australia where uh, recreational and charter industry fall into this, and have, and if you could talk about that aspect, and also the idea of. What would you say? Off space yet in terms of having the jur I mean, we've got to deal with the jurisdiction issues. So I mean, the, the, the problem still exists, but we don't have a way to systematically go about doing this. Uh, as part of a, a, a group that's working uh, through on, here on the West Coast, we've developed a tool that uh, we hope will, will be useful. It, it, it's, it sounds useful for trade-off analysis. Uh, that on for ecosystem-based um, approaches, and that paper should be out fairly soon. Um, but it's it's you know th th we still don't have the institutions that 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 is going to make in you know those things. And the other part is we don't have the systematically gathered information, particularly socioeconomic, about the various uses. It's not it's not gathered appropriately. So we're 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 moving into that space. I think it's going to. It's going to be something that, that comes uh, over time, but it and, and has to come over time. But it's it's. Uh, I don't think we're doing a lot of it yet. answer briefly perhaps uh, I, I think I, I